Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that move, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we're getting you ready for Monday Night Football as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 289. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Ben Fennell about the Eagles' Week 12 matchup with the Seattle Seahawks on Monday Night Football. As always, Ben and I are going to talk about what went into the production of Eagles' game plan this week, this week's matchup with Seattle, the keys to victory for the Eagles, and some huge one-on-one battles and stats. Do you need to know for this game all at the top of the show in Chalk Talk. After that, Ben and I are going to go through our scouting report segment where this week I wanted to focus in on one of the top pass catchers for the Seahawks team. That's wide receiver Tyler Lockett. How can he impact this game against the Eagles and how does he pair with and complement DK Metcalf? How has his game changed since his days at Kansas State? We'll cover all of that in our scouting report. The show does not end there though because at the end of today's show I also caught up with Eagles safety Jalen Mills to talk about his athletic background and how he got to where he is today in the Eagles secondary. Before we get there, though, just a couple of things I wanted to make sure we hit on. As a quick reminder, the best way to throw us your support is to go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating or leave us a comment. If you leave us a question on there, I will be sure to respond to it right here on the show. Also, mentioned Eagles game plan. I also want to mention the Journey to the Draft podcast with myself and Ben Fennell. You can go check that out wherever podcasts can be found. If you're ready to start tuning in to who the top prospects are going to be in next year's NFL Draft, Ben and I have got you covered. We're doing Journey every single week. We do Eagle Eye every single week. We also work on Eagles Game Plan every single week. And you know, Before I get to my chat with Ben, I want to give a little bit of a tease to a segment that we had from this week's episode. It's a conversation I had with Eagles linebackers coach Ken Flagel. Not only will some of this be in the show, but there's a lot that was off the cutting room floor that made it I saved right here for this podcast. Let's get to that interview. It's a segment we call Tape Study, presented by Chickies and Pete's. Eagles linebackers coach Ken Flagel. Coach, welcome back to the show. Good to be back. Thank you for having me. All right, well, let's talk through uh, this goal line stand from the first quarter, Coach, and really just kind of take us through what makes it work and some of the little things that really helped lead to the stop. And we'll start here on first down, a run stuff in the middle. Yeah, they get into their goal line personnel, and obviously we substitute and we go to our goal line package, which brings in six defensive linemen and really four linebackers and one safety. So they're getting big to run the ball, and we're getting big to try to stop the run. And all they're trying to do really, Fran, is just knock color out of the hole. I mean, it's the ball's on the one-yard line. Anything that's a one-yard gain or more is success for the offense. So, again, That guard doesn't have a particular blocking assignment other than just to push the pile and knock any off-color jersey out of the hole. The reason we had success on this down is, number one, I'll just bring your attention to 91, Fletcher Cox. Fletcher does a great job of getting penetration to begin with, and he really knocks their tackle back, which prevents their guard to really come around and get up on T.J. Edwards. The fact that the guard can't get up creates an advantage for the defense. So TJ does a nice job of playing downhill into that open gap. We get Alex Singleton as an overlap linebacker on this particular play. And again, nice job by everybody along the front. But I would just say this. To me, the beginning point begins the fact that number 91 wins the down on the tackle. That's where, in my opinion, that's where the play got stopped initially. And then we've got great pursuit to the ball and we clean up the pile. It's so interesting for you to break that down, Coach, because so often I feel like we see those uh, goal line plays and almost just looks like a giant car wreck in there, lots of bodies. But as you kind of illustrated, there's a lot that goes in tactically and from a technique standpoint for everybody along the line and then at the second level as well. Correct. And, and the thing that you're trying to emphasize down on the goal line is, is you're trying to emphasize penetration with your defensive front. Because, again, a one-yard gain is not a successful down for the defense when they're down on the one-yard line. And I think Fletch did that. He did a great job of getting penetration. And as you can see from the film clip, it changed their offside guard. He couldn't get around on the front side linebacker to get that push that they wanted. So now let's go to third down now. On second down, Baker Mayfield throws an incomplete pass. So we come back now, third down, down on the goal line. Take us through what made this play work. 
All right, so they shift to a double wing formation. They're still in their goal line package, as are we. And they're going to try to run uh, what we call a lead play. They've got this little jet motion, and they're pulling their front side guard for Davion Taylor. So he's going to try to set the edge for us. He's going to kick that inside leg up on contact and try to firm that thing up. And then we're going to try to knock everything back to TJ Edwards and back to Rodney McLeod. But I think the unsung hero, in my opinion, on this one is Malik Jackson. He does a nice job of stalemating the tackle. He gets some penetration, and he's able to tear off late on the down, and we get a little bit of a body on the running back, and we get him down short of the goal line. Now, we got some guys pursuing from the backside, but when you get those big 300-pounders now leaning on you, you have a tendency to go down fast. Gave us a chance to play fourth down and give us another chance to defend one more play. Coach, you talked about Davion Taylor there on that play. Well, what has, what's been your sense of his development, obviously coming from a different kind of role in college to how he was used, and what has his adjustment been like so far in the NFL? Well, I'm very proud of him, uh, Fran. He's done a great job for us. I mean, he came in playing basically kind of a nickel position at Colorado, and now he's got to transition more into a true inside, outside linebacker type of role. And so a lot of it's been new to him, but he's really come along. I mean, he's grown every day. He's got a great work ethic, and he's a smart kid. So I'm really happy with him. I think he's made great improvement, and I just see him as a guy that's going to continue to rise as the more he gets a chance to play. And as he gets more experience, he's just going to get better and better. So, Coach, that was a third down stop. Now take us through this fourth down stop. And I guess before the snap, we see this little motion here where they take the running back and kind of switch the formation. If you can kind of just take us through what impact does that have and what are they trying to accomplish there with that late motion? What they're trying to do is they're trying to create, uh, see if you're going to shift the front, if you're going to change where your three technique tackle is and where your two eye is. Now, we were in a front that didn't require that to happen. This was not a big zone read team. There's a lot to it, but we stayed in what we called our jet front. And they just try to run a belly open play and see if they can stick it in there and gain that yard. If they can push that front, get that yard that they need for the touchdown. The front did a great job of firming it up. I think TJ and Alex did a nice job of firming up their gaps. But again, the guy to me that made the play was 21. He's got to take the ball off the down block on that three technique that we've got right there. And he does a great job of triggering fast. And Jalen got just enough of them as this play went to review that when this guy went down, you can see he puts his elbow down, touches the ground just prior short of the goal line before the ball crosses. And in our rules, that means down by contact. And it was short. This was a big momentum swing for us. Anytime you can take points off the board and hold them on a goal line stand, it gives the defense great juice. And, and it's a great game changer, in my opinion. Coach, you and I have talked a lot about the guy, the linebacker level, the high speed internet needed to be able to process everything that's happening. What does it say about a guy like Jalen, a, a former corner so far in the NFL, making that transition to safety and being able to read and key and diagnose that play as quickly as he did on the goal line? Well, the one thing we all know from Jalen's past experience when he was a corner, Jalen was never afraid to be part of the run game. He was always a very willing run support guy. And I just think you see that attitude from him, that willingness to get in there and mix it up in the run game transfers into him being a safety now. So again, that was always part of his DNA and it became up big for us here on this particular play. It's a great conversation there with Coach Flagel. He broke down three plays from this game, so make sure you go check that out on this week's version of Eagles Game Plan, which will be up on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagles mobile app on Friday. If you're local to the Philadelphia area, you can always check it out Sunday morning, 10 a.m. on NBC10. All right, talking about Eagles Game Plan, let's talk with the guy that was a big part of the production of the show every single week. That's Ben Fennel. Let's dive into our chat now in Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, back again, once again, here for Chalk Talk on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, my friend Ben Fennel. Ben, uh, we're going to get into this Eagles-Seahawks matchup, and obviously we spent a lot of time preparing for it uh, with Eagles game plan this week. Really the crux of the episode, looking at the, the Eagles defense against the Seahawks offense. With Seattle, we focused in on their pass game. Russell Wilson, obviously everything he's done, uh, throwing the football has been outstanding this year, um, especially in the first half of the season so far. But, uh, you know, they've kind of cooled off a little bit throwing the football the last couple of weeks, but still – 
what they want to do. They're going to attack vertically. They're great beating up man coverage with uh, the speed they've got on the field and then their route concepts, uh, a lot of crossing routes to, uh, you know, get, you know, basically use that, use that speed, get their, their receivers running away from corners. Uh, and they do that really, really well at all levels of the field. And then, Seahawks defense, the big thing, obviously, I know the numbers have not been great, but uh, Jamal Adams as a blitzer, certainly a new kind of wrinkle uh, that we're not necessarily used to with this Seattle front. So uh, I think ultimately those were the two points that we wanted to hit on. Uh, A lot to talk through, though, and obviously offensively, this group's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Just the Seahawks offense has taken on such a different identity these last kind of year and a half with being much more of a pass-focused team coming from a run-dominant team. You can look back just to 2019, they used to be running the ball six most. 2018, they ran the ball the most in the NFL. They're all the way down to 24th this year. So much different philosophical approach, keeping the ball in Russell Wilson's hands which usually yields better results. So it's kind of an interesting style change with the Seahawks offense. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the, the whole let Russ cook thing was, you know, hey, we're going to throw the football, not just more, but more often on early downs, first down, second down. We're going to throw the football more. Uh, and that, that did yield a lot of positive results early. Um, but over the last couple of weeks, I think Russell has kind of cooled down just a little bit. Uh, you know, and it hasn't been quite as productive as what we saw. And I think ultimately, look, the, the big thing that we've seen from him I would say against the blitz, he's taken a, a, some more sacks than I think you would like. And that's kind of been a, a thing with him throughout the course of his career. You'll see him take some sacks and he's going to try and run around and hold on to the football a little bit by time. And he'll take some sacks uh, in the backfield. And he's also had some uncharacteristic turnovers as well um, over the course of the last few weeks. But uh, ultimately still, when you look at the season as a whole, uh, he has been one of the most productive players uh, in the league, especially at the quarterback position. Is there an aspect of this game that you feel like, man, uh, you know, we, we could have fit this into the show that you felt like we, we kind of uh, left a little bit of meat on the bone? Yeah, I think there's some interesting aspects with Seattle's defense still. Jamal Adams as the blitzer being the box safety. But I'm really intrigued with Quandre Diggs since he came over from Detroit in the middle of last year, I want to say. This guy is a spark plug on the back end, loves the rob the middle of the field, loves to take away those in breakers. He's a hard hitter. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting matchup, Quandre Diggs versus the middle of the field of the Eagles offense. Yeah, I think that's a, a really, really good point. It's certainly something uh, to keep an eye on. To, to me, it's the the run game because that's the thing is that when you look at the Seattle offense, it's like you said, I mean, the, the identity has kind of changed. The philosophy has kind of changed a little bit. But what we've seen from them, and Greg made this point earlier this week on the show, Last week, they, I mean, they leaned a little bit more heavily on the run game, and they're getting Chris Carson back uh, here this week. And so uh, just kind of – we didn't really mention the run game at all uh, in the episode, and obviously that's a, a big part of Brian Schottenheimer with Pete Carroll, what they want to be offensively. Uh, getting Chris Carson back, I think, kind of gives them a little bit more juice. They're undefeated uh, when he starts a game. Uh, you know, so far this year, they've been, they're, I think they're 5-0 and uh, when he's in the lineup. So ultimately, I think that was one big part uh, that, you know, would have liked to be able to get in. One big thing I think that's kind of interesting, and one of the things I almost want to talk through a little bit uh, with the listeners, you know, talking about the Seattle Seahawks offense and talking about their pass game in particular, one thing that they do really, really well is they'll use tight splits from the receivers. They'll kind of bring the formation in tight. I want to ask you, what is it to, for you that really intrigues you when the offenses kind of bring everybody in tight and the receivers are inside the numbers? What does that do for the offense? Well, it creates a lot more uh, flexibility with your play calling horizontally. It leaves more room to the sideline, more uh, areas of the field to attack as opposed to being in a wide spacing set where you have receivers traditionally outside the numbers squeezed to the sideline. There's really only one, one direction for them to go. It's either across the field or up the field, but those tight splits give that receiver more of a two-way go, can work more field horizontally and laterally. And then the the run game assignments and the different nuances you can do with ex- exchanging blocking assignments, double teaming backside C gaps, splitting, you know, split flowing ends with slot receivers and aspects like that we've seen around the league. You do a lot of creative blocking scheme exchanges with those tight split alignments. Now, the downside, everybody likes to highlight positives of things, positives of pre-snap motion, positives of tight splits. There's cons to it as well. 
all these schemes have pros and cons. Otherwise, everybody would be running the same thing every Sunday. Now, some of the negatives, you reduce the offense. What does that mean? You reduce the defense. That presents more threats to the offense in a more confined space. So these spread offenses, empty sets, typically that's to spread the defense out to eliminate potential threats, particularly pressure threats, blitz threats. You reduce the formation, that reduces the defense. All of a sudden, the number of potential threats are that much greater and harder to diagnose because everybody's kind of in that phone booth. So there's a lot of different uh, you know avenues and philosophies and aspects of the schemes, but that's kind of the vanilla. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good point, especially in talking about you know one of the big things we I feel like I've seen from the Seahawks offense in the year in years past studying them a lot of empty. You know, they go empty, and now Russell Wilson he's a threat with his legs. They don't do they don't use empty formations a lot these days. I think you said they were like sixth fewest in the NFL. I think it was the the number that uh, you had looked up. But when they are in empty, they're one of the most explosive offenses in the NFL. And so that, I think that's kind of interesting. They, we talk about how they use a lot of these tight formations. But when they do go empty, that really kind of uh, you kind of really see the positives out of spreading the defense out and getting those guys uh, out sideline to sideline with all that speed. Um, you know, it's certainly a formation that works really, really well for them as well. Uh, let's get into some matchups here. Is there one specific one-on-one battle that uh, you're most intrigued to watch on Monday night? Oh, absolutely. Now, we saw the Seattle Seahawks and particularly big DK Metcalf. We saw him twice last year. You know, once in the regular season and once in uh, down in the playoffs. But you have to, re- or excuse me, uh, yeah, down in the playoffs. But you have to remember, uh, Darius Slay did not see him at all last year. Mm. So I'm thinking it's going to be a really interesting matchup. Big DK Metcalf against the veteran press corner, Darius Slay. Just want to see how that matchup goes. DK is really a tough one to figure out for me on a week-to-week basis and who he's having success against. I don't know who's going to come out on top. I don't even know if Slay will see him most of the afternoon. But if they match up against one another, definitely want to see how that result goes. Yeah, he's uh, just such a, a ridiculous physical specimen you know, when you look at DK Metcalf. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at the way that his game has kind of evolved, he has certainly gotten better uh, in, in some of the subtleties of route running and getting in and out of breaks. Uh, but just so when you look at where he uh, wins, where he excels, it is on that linear plane. It is vertically down the field. Get him the football on the run uh, or in the vertical area, and he is just – I mean, he's outstanding, and he's really, yeah, no really question. difficult to And there stop. are two two very different games. That first one, he's still kind of figuring out his way in the offense at three for 35. But that playoff game, Eagles fans all remember, seven for 160 and a touchdown. So uh, definitely left some nightmares on the back end of our defense. Yeah, I've got a, a number here. Metcalf is on pace for just under 1,400 yards receiving and 14 touchdowns this year. Uh, you know, just – I mean – Ridiculous! It would be the first player uh, with 1,300 plus yards and 14 touchdowns in a single season since 2015. So, in, since a, in a half decade, when Brandon Marshall and Allen Robinson did that. So, uh, those are some numbers from NFL Research. I think when you look at uh, Metcalf, he's one of the, the the toughest matchups in the NFL. Ultimately, he fell in the draft because of his medical. Right? I mean, when you look at a guy coming off the injury he had uh, in his college in his college career, uh, that would explain why a guy that has that those kind of physical skills, despite the the fact that he was raw, the, when he has the, the, that injury on, you know, on his resume, that's going to cause some people to kind of worry about it a little bit. But um, no question, he is a, a really, really intriguing player. And then uh, another guy um, that I'll be watching here in this one, I think it's going to be really impactful, is going to be Carlos Dunlap. Because, you know, the, the, the Seahawks, they're looking for some more pass rush juice. Uh, you know, they trade for him at the deadline. The Eagles have already seen Dunlap uh, so far this season when they played the, the Cincinnati Bengals in week three. Dunlap was very active in that game. I think when you look at this matchup, whoever's at right tackle, whether it's Lane Johnson or uh, if he's not able to go, whoever's in there uh, on the right side, that matchup with Dunlap is going to be one of the biggest ones. Dunlap had two sacks uh, in the game against the Arizona Cardinals. He was all over the place. He's chasing plays down to the sideline. You could tell he had all kinds of juice uh, lining up for, for that organization for the first time. So uh, to me, that's a big matchup certainly to watch. Was that kind of what you saw from Dunlap as well in his debut? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, interesting kind of signing there. They've really acquired a lot of veteran presence over the last calendar year to kind of uh, make a good competitive run. Dunlap looks like he's got some uh, left in the tank to provide. Yeah, no question. Uh, give us your stats, man. I, I want to hear some some numbers that, um, that really kind of caught your eye when it comes to this matchup. 
Yeah, this one particularly, a lot of different things, and for for better and worse for both teams. And let's dive into Russell Wilson here, perennial MVP candidate, but he's actually kind of behind in a lot of categories that are surprising, in my opinion. He has three interceptions in the red zone. That's second most in the NFL. He's 31st in quarterback rating on third down, something we don't traditionally see with Russell Wilson, 26 on completion percentage on third down. Some of those clutch areas of the field, red zone, third down, have not been the Russell Wilson we're accustomed to, particularly over the last month. Started the season really hot. Over the last month, has been very up and down, some uncharacteristic play, and I know he's aware of it first and foremost. Now some of the positives, though. Seahawks drifting away from the run game. That means they're also drifting away from play action usage. They're about the middle of the pack in the NFL, but where the styles kind of conflict is they're very successful in play action. Russell Wilson leads the NFL in play action completion percentage, 76%. So they're generating a lot of big plays, explosive plays, and an efficient offense off play action. He has nine touchdowns, only two interceptions, some of the best aspects of the Seattle Seahawks offense. And when you have that little Russell Wilson, little quarterbacks, Kyler Murray, people like that, what do you want to do, Fran? get separation from the line of scrimmage, separation from the defensive line so he could sit back and survey. Mm. So I think they should commit a little more to the run game, try to commit a little more to using that play action, not only getting him separated from the line of scrimmage to survey, also to use his legs and kind of get him on the edge and on the perimeter and move the pocket. I think that's the best formula for the Seahawks. So Mm. a lot of differing kind of philosophies and aspects of this team and offense Russell Wilson's still a talented player and will still will hang, you know, 400 yards and five touchdowns on you in a blink if you, uh, if you give him a chance. Yeah, I think with what he has done vertically down the field this year, I mean, I know that the deep ball uh, has not been as effective for them over the last few weeks as it was. Really, the, the kind of the line of demarcation, a lot of people say, you know, you say, like I mentioned the stat earlier about it being Chris Carson when he went out of the lineup. It was go before the bye and after the bye. And you look at what they did in those first five weeks before their bye week. I mean, uh, Russell Wilson was 13 for 23 on vertical throws down the field, uh, you know, going into the, that game. Eight touchdowns, no picks. Since then, in the last four game, or the last five games, six for 24 downfield, 25% completion, three touchdowns, three picks. So for whatever reason, they just have not been able to get things going down the field over the last few weeks. But the potential is still there. And when we watch all their big plays from this season, what they've been able to do attacking downfield, uh, that's going to, you know, you have to account for that going into this matchup. So, all right. Uh, and one last, one last stat for your friend. I'm going to put the stat out. Okay. You give me the context. Okay, I love it. What it means to you. I love looking at pro football focus, time to throw. It's really reflecting what quarterbacks get the ball out of their hands, which ones that want to, you know, extend the play, improvisational second reaction throws. The three quarterbacks this year holding the ball on the longest, Russell Wilson, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson is last. Mm -hmm. What does it say about those three quarterbacks and their propensity to hang on to the ball and extend the play. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's second reaction quarterbacks, right? Guys that have that ability to create. Uh, they're going to run around. They're going to try and buy time for the receivers to be able to uncover and then hit them down the field. And so not only is it going to be uh, you know, a play action, deep shots, they're going to hold on to the football, but it's those, hey, when they're scrambling and running around. And, that, and that's the thing, you know, Last year, I watched every sack in the NFL. That was just one of the things I did throughout the course of the season. You'll be surprised how many bad sacks, you know, people will kind of rag on a lot of quarterbacks. Oh, the ball should have been out. The ball should have been out. Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray. uh, These guys take some really just brutal sacks, but you're willing to forgive that because those come with those some of those plays. crazy big plays. <laughs> so you're willing to free, you know, kind of give and take that a little bit. So it doesn't shock me that those guys would be at the top of the totem, totem pole there, the top three. And from a schematic standpoint, we're seeing less empty sets from the Seattle Seahawks. What do you typically get when you're an empty? Ball's coming out fast. Hmm. A lot more, you know, play yep. action. What do you get with play action? Long developing plays. So I think that's also, there's some schematic elements that's forcing him to hold on to the ball too. No, that's a really, really good point. Uh, and one of the guys that he is looking for when he is holding on to the football is the wide receiver, Tyler Lockett. And he is going to be the subject this week in our scouting report. Dim those lights. We're headed to the film room for the scouting report. All right, Ben, well, let's talk about Tyler Lockett. Cause this is a guy that I remember you and I both liked uh, when he was coming out of Kansas state a few years ago. 
he is one of the most criminally underrated players in the league, uh, in my opinion, because he is just – he checks all, almost all the boxes. I'm interested to get your thoughts on him when he was coming out of Kansas State, and then we can talk about how that game is translated to the NFL. Yeah, I was uh, a huge crush of his – or he was a crush of mine coming out of Kansas State there and in his young five-year career. Can't believe he was a third-round pick. What an absolute steal in that 2015 draft. But coming out of K-State, he was a shade under 5'10", 182 pounds, ran 4'4". So major concerns, Fran, just physicality-wise, small hands, small arm length. Typically, red flags. I mean, he was 8 and 3 eighths hands arm length only 30 inches. So this was definitely a compact, undersized, lacking length style of receiver. But he was prolific in his career at Kansas State. He was an All-American kick returner as a freshman and then ascended to a All-American as a receiver his senior year. at back-to-back thousand yard, double digit touchdown seasons his final two years. I was able to see him in person his senior year, back-to-back weeks, win against Texas, win against Oklahoma. 14 for 189 and touchdown in those two games it was really an impressive player because he was undersized. And this is what started this thought in every draft class. He was sub six, sub six feet, sub 200 pounds, undersized by every metric Fran. But I didn't see anything that this guy couldn't do. And every year I try to find an undersized receiver that I say, there's nothing this guy can't do. And I pick one every year, whether it's Sterling Shepard or Taewon Taylor or X, Y, and Z. But this guy won outside the numbers, in the slot, isolation, screens, yards after catch, possession receivers, junk ball, sideline awareness. He can win down the field, can win with double moves. Oh, yeah, the kick returning. Oh, yeah, punt coverage. He'll make tackles on special teams. So he did a lot of interesting stuff in his routes, a lot of snap, dynamic route runner, interesting release package. Some of those cons, though, the hands, the arms, the catch radius had a couple drops concentration drops where he looked to get up field a little too quick six fumbles in his career major concern considering doesn't have a whole lot of play strength and size he's going to be able to take the physicality from nfl safeties if you're small typically you're projected to be in the slot you gonna be able to handle that wear and tear he was easily tackled at times and rarely faced press coverage in the big 12 so Mm. interesting package receiver there but when you go back and look at that class in 2015 Man, he he didn't really give you a whole lot to worry about when you're watching the film. So there, there are a few things that I want to hit on. Uh, you mentioned one thing at the end there about the, the press coverage. And it was tough to find reps of him against press coverage. Two games that I did, uh, TCU against Jason Verrett and then Texas. Uh, you saw plenty of press coverage in that game as well. Texas, I thought he butchered them uh, when they tried to press him, and I thought he was really good. Uh, he had a, a couple of really big-time catches. He beat Jason Verrett on a double move on a stop-and-go 74-yard touchdown, uh, and Verrett was rarely beaten at TCU. He was a really, really good player, um, but that was uh, a, an element of his game that I was really intrigued to see going down to Mobile because he went to the Senior Bowl. Dude, he made some outstanding catches throughout the course of the week down there at the Senior Bowl. He was one of my favorite players down there. Um, you know, and I, I had questions about him because of the size, the the, the size limitations uh, that you mentioned. He was really productive. I mean, he had, he had almost 250 catches in college, and he was a great kick returner. I mean, he was really, really productive. But then you get to it's it's funny because um, earlier this week on the Journey of the Draft podcast, uh, I've I've teased it up before here on the show, but uh, every week I've got an Eagles scout that comes onto the show and uh, breaks down a current Eagle. And one of the things that Anthony Patch, who's the Eagles college, uh, college scouting director, he talked about Jason Kelsey this week. And he said, you know, yeah, he was really undersized, but the lack of size this didn't necessarily show up on film. And I think when you look at Lockett, like, yeah, they, of course, at that size, there are going to be times where, yeah, like he's not going to over, you know, out jump every corner and things of that nature. But that didn't keep him from being really productive. That didn't keep him from making plays at every level of the field. And uh, to me, like that, that's kind of one of the things that I kind of take away from Tyler Lockett is that, that number one. Then he goes down to the senior bowl, has the great week I talk, that I talked about. He tests well at the combine. He's got the NFL bloodlines, right? His dad, Kevin, uh, was a, a longtime receiver out in Kansas City. He had an uncle who played in the NFL as well. Um, so a lot of scouts will point to that and say, yeah, like this is an example of why we look, we like guys that uh, are used to playing in the, or, you know, have the, the, it's in the family business, right? Uh, you know, they, they've got the bloodlines. They know what playing in the league is all about. It's not going to be too big for them. There's just a lot of things that you kind of point to Tyler Lockett and say, yeah, like it's not a shock that this guy uh, turned into the player that he did. Um, he's, but dude, he's just, he is so fun to watch. And to me, like uh, the one thing I said this earlier in the, in the week with Greg, one of the things, the more and more I watch the NFL, the more and more I watch football in general, 
a trait that I value at the receiver position, the ability to play through contact in all areas, despite the fact that he's 5'10", you know, under 190 pounds, Lockett plays through contact so, so well. And that competitiveness, that toughness, that's a big part of the reason why. So, Fran, where do you come out with – we've been studying the draft for a number of times. I feel like this is a lesson to learn here because we get so wrapped up in scouting the metrics. And when you look at Lockett, under 10% percentile for arm length, under 7% percentile for hand length or hand size, height and weight, both under 20 percentile. So this is a, um, when you're scouting the metrics, you're dropping him rounds based on the metrics. But is he an outlier when you look at that style and that, you know, ability to be successful at the next level? Is he a mold or is he an outlier with that? And you say, you know what? He was, you know, a very low percentile and all these metrics that I covet in value. I didn't see any of those issues on the film. But when I see this player next year, I'm still going to have concerns because I think Tyler Lockett's more of the unicorn than it than anything else i know it's it's very very difficult because you, there are plenty of guys that uh certainly had some of those limitations that did not work out and to be fair i mean it's like you said he had some of those focus drops he had issues with ball security and so you would say all right well the small hand size like that carried over to the film right and it's, it's it's really tough to be able to kind of pinpoint that but uh I think it's a really good question. We kind of had that discussion about receivers that, um, you know, kind of had that skill set, that ability to get in and out of breaks and were really crafty route runners that could create their own separation. We talked about that with Richard Higgins. I think Lockett, to a certain extent, fits that. The, the thing is, is that he had that 4-4 ability. We see that now, and he's an outstanding ball tracker, his ability to look, look the ball in uh, over the yeah. shoulder. I mean, he's I mean, one of the best in the league right now uh, at doing that. But, uh, you know, to me – it's a it's a good conversation, and I, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around just the wide receiver position in general, and um, you know, kind of rethinking the way I view it because there are a lot of traits that I, I'm starting to value more and more that don't necessarily show up, uh, you know, in, in a spreadsheet. They're not necessarily quantifiable. They're not in a stat sheet. Uh, I think that you know that playing through contact, the competitiveness, the ball tracking, some of that stuff, I look at, and it's just like it's so so important to have that level of success in the NFL. Yeah, I think we get so wrapped up in some of the some of the metrics and things and whether you see that issue translating onto the film and into the tape or not. And I just think it's a lesson for people to say, you know what, don't create thresholds for positions, in my opinion. Have an idea of what you like, but don't immediately rule somebody out because they didn't fit in your threshold. Because I say it, we talk about this all the time. When you make thresholds, you just miss on good players. Because they don't always come in the same shape, size, mold, you know, prototypical, you know, on paper size all the time. You got to give everybody their due diligence to say, you know what, he may not fit our metrics and threshold, but what does the film say? Is he getting his job done? How does he look on the film? And maybe that's a lesson for you to say, you know what, he doesn't have to be 6'1", 199 pounds to play my Z position. I could survive with this guy. And there's lessons yeah. at every position to learn like that. I think so. It's the conversations like that that we have every single week over on the Journey to the Draft podcast driven by AAA. You can catch Ben and I twice a week over on that show wherever podcasts can be found. Ben, thanks so much once again for joining us here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. We'll catch up with you next week. Experience the fastest internet and more in a snap. With Xfinity X5, you get the speed, coverage, control, and security you need for the ultimate in-home Wi-Fi experience. Xfinity, proud partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Great stuff from Ben, who you can follow on Twitter just like I do, at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here with Eagles Entertainment. You know I greatly appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That's one way to support the show. But the best way is going to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Leave us a rating or leave us a comment. I want to give a shout-out today who's someone who did just that. M. Cresito left a five-star review saying they're listening from Texas at Avid listener, loyal Eagles fan, love the show, not holding back from criticizing the team and coaches when needed. Cruzito, really appreciate that. And then CooperDog51 left us a five-star review saying, love the film breakdowns and the show so much. Thanks so much to both Cruzito and Cooper for all of your support. Thanks so much for those two reviews. All right, before we wrap this show up, I told you I caught up with Eagles safety Jalen Mills to talk about his background as an athlete. Let's get to that interview right now. Well, excited to welcome in Eagles safety Jalen Mills into here to our one-on-one interview. Jalen, welcome back, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
All right, well, let's talk through uh, really your background because obviously I think there's been so much written about your versatility. You've played inside, outside. You've played safety. Going back to your days at LSU, but I, I want to go back to young Jalen. What, what was your the first sport that you played growing up and your first love athletically? Uh, yeah, my first love was actually basketball. Okay. Um, I was a point guard. Um, they used to call me Shorty because uh, I used to always watch uh, Duke in Kentucky um, when guys were bringing the, um, the, the basketball down the court when they were on defense. You know, they used to slap the floor and get real low on defense. So, uh, Coach used to always call me Shorty because I used to always do that and try to get real low. So, uh, my first love was, was actually basketball. All right. So, who was your favorite player growing up? Um, actually, my favorite player growing up was Kobe Bryant. Okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Can't. Can't put that past me. No you know, question. Mamba mentality. Sure. Yeah. All right. So when was, when did you start playing football? Um, not until I was about maybe ten or eleven. Um, I kind of got into football because my my I have an older brother, three years older than me. Um, while I was playing basketball, he was playing football, and then you know one day I just walked in the house and I told my mom like, you know, I want to go to football practice with my brother. You know what I'm saying? So she she threw me out there, and then it was a wrap ever since. When, so you go from being a point guard in basketball. What was your first position playing football? <sighs> Man, uh, I was number 99. I played defensive end. <laughs> skinny, skinny. The go. skinniest dude out there at defensive end with number 99 on, man. So I, last week I talked with Boston Scott. Yep. That was his first. He played defensive end when he first started <laughs> playing, and it was the same kind of deal. When did you make the transition to, to play out uh, in the secondary? Um, Actually, I didn't play – in the secondary until I want to say my sophomore year in high school. Really? Yeah. So, uh, before that, um, I played quarterback, um, quarterback, running back, and wide receiver. What was it like playing quarterback? Uh, it was cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> back, you know, in little league, you don't have too many plays. Either you're, you're throwing a nine ball or you're running QB draw every other play. So <laughs> it was pretty easy. <laughs> so let me ask you this, because you're going back and looking at, like, your uh, your high school, like, your, your recruiting profile coming out of DeSoto. So you were a three-star recruit by, like, everybody, and you, you're, only your big offers were, like, Colorado State, Memphis, Houston, and then LSU comes in. Yeah. What, what was that process like for you when LSU comes in and gives you that offer? Yeah, so I'll take you through the whole story. Okay. Um, my the three schools I had sat down with my mentor. He was my uh, my high school DB coach at the time. He's now coaches at Tulsa DB. He's a DB coach there, but me and him kind of sat down uh, right before my junior year or right after my junior year. And he he asked me. He was like, "Hey, like, what school do you see yourself going to?" And I was like, um, "I like Oregon. I like Florida State, and I like LSU." Um, so he was like, okay, well, let's map out. You know, you like you said, I was a three-star athlete, so I really wasn't on anybody's radar. Okay, let's. well, we know what you got. You know, we know your talent. Let's try to get to these camps. You know, let's try to get in front of these coaches, try to get an offer. Well, Oregon was too far. Um, sure. Florida State, their camp was uh, booked up and sold out, so you, nobody could get in. So I ended up going to the LSU camp. Um, ended up going to LSU camp. It was a, a two-day camp. Uh, where it was two camps in one day. Um, so we go to the camp. We're doing, like, one-on-one, seven-on-seven. You know, guys are getting offered on the spot, you know, at the at the AM camp. Um, and I'm just like, man, like, I ain't get no offer. Like, I didn't do good enough. Come back to the evening camp. I was like, all right, like, I got to turn it up. And I was like, I didn't drive way from Dallas to Louisiana, six-hour drive, not to get an offer. Um, I just end up, you know, impressing the coaches. Coach Miles called me up to his office. He he offered me, and as soon as he offered me, I told him, like, on the spot I wanted to commit. He told me, he was like, you know, we're offering you. You don't have to commit right now. You know, we want you to weigh your options. You know, super nice guy. You wouldn't think you would get that out of a, a coach coaching the LSU, he, like, saying you can weigh your options out. And I was like, nah, like, this is where I want to be. This is one of my top schools, and this is where I, the school I want to go to for the next four years. So despite all that, I mean, you get you get that offer, and then you show up, and even though you were, uh, a, I say just, but you were just a three-star recruit, you play as as a freshman. Yeah. What what was that like? That process, that that off season leading up to that, did you kind of have to earn your stripes a little bit? Yes, I did. I actually, um, everybody seen me as number twenty-eight for LSU, but as soon as I got there, uh, I actually had a, a t-shirt in my. I I didn't know how like college football and all this stuff worked. I just played football because I liked it. I show up to my locker and it's like, uh, 
I had a T-shirt and it had number 36 on it. And I was just like, <laughs> I'm like going through the lockers like, okay, maybe this is a 36 locker. Like, it's no way. Like, I got number 36. So I go to the equipment guys <laughs> and I'm like, man, it's, like, what, what's my number? Like, like, I don't have a number. And they were like, it's on your shirt. And I was like, 36? And they were like, yeah. I was like, no, man, we got to change this. And they was like, no rookie. I mean, no freshman come here and say that they want to change the number. But um, all fun and games, though. I ended up, you know, going out there, learning from, you know, a couple guys. Tyron Matthew was there. Um, Eric Reed was there. Um, it was it was a lot, a lot of guys there, and they kind of just taught me the ropes in the secondary, and I ended up earning earning that role. And then, of course, once I got the starting spot, you know, they gave me number 28. And then you go on, you, I mean, you become a, a four-year starter. You play just like you did here in Philadelphia. You play outside, you play inside, you play safety. Do you think about just the, the kind of the, uh, the similarities between that, that arc uh, in your career, both in college and in the NFL? Yeah. Um, so I think the biggest thing now is I was always taught, you know, to be, you know, a complete defensive back. Not one guy who can just play corner, who can play nickel, but a guy who can play corner, nickel, and then both safety spots, you know what I'm saying, can play both sides of the field because you have guys out here who can only play. I just want to play left corner. I want to play right corner. I want to play left safety. I want to play right safety. You know, being able to play the whole field that way, if emergency happens or it's a certain package, you know, coach can say, okay, well, we can plug Mills in here and it won't be a drop-off anywhere. Earlier this week, I caught up with uh, linebackers coach Ken Flagel. We talked about that goal line stand. You make the stop on fourth and one down on the goal line. I want to ask you, what, what has that transition been like for you, going from playing corner to now playing more up close to the line of scrimmage in the box? Uh, you, you did a little bit in college. What's it been like for you over the last uh, over the season here uh, in Philadelphia? I mean, I like it, man. You know, I'm, I'm around the ball more. Uh, I'm getting more opportunities, you know, to get tackles, maybe get a sack or a forced fumble or a fumble recovery, whatever it may be. Um, so I'm a lot more active. You know, one thing that I, I've told guys um, in the locker room is the difference between um, me playing corner and me playing safety was corner was more like cat and mouse all day. You know, it's, it's cat and mouse. It's like who makes the first mistake? Is it the receiver make the first mistake or is the cornerback going to make the first mistake? And then now at, at, at safety – it's just more active. Like, the game is actually, I know this kind of sounds crazy, it's a lot faster down there in the box because sure. you got a lot of guys moving in a lot of different places. You got to make a lot of calls, um, and your eyes have to be in the right spot. So, for sure, man, I, I like it a lot. Well, Jalen, it's been great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for joining us in this one-on-one. -on -one. Stay safe, stay healthy. Happy Thanksgiving. Yep. We'll talk to you soon. Yep, thank you so much, man. Well, thanks so much to Jalen Mills and to all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings here at Eagles Entertainment. All that being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the NovaCare Complex, I'm Fran Duffy. We'll talk to you next week. Raise a glass to that comforting feeling of an Eagles touchdown with the all-new Broad and Patterson Wine Collection created in partnership with Wink. Featuring a Cabernet, a Rosé, and a Chardonnay, Broad and Patterson wines are the perfect pairing for any occasion. Now you can bring the sweet taste of victory with you to a dinner with friends or to the tailgate with your game day crew. Purchase online today at philadelphiaeagles.com slash wine to stock up and have Broad and Patterson delivered right to your door. A portion of proceeds from every bottle benefit Eagles Autism Foundation.